Once a year, the river rises and the vegetation shifts. This opens a door to a parallel universe. Cédric Gentil accompanies me on the first observation mission. Elephant bones mark the way. Even the strongest animals do not escape the law of the jungle. Just below the surface, we come to a glimmering and unexplored twilight zone. We don't see any crocodiles or fish, and we continue on through the labyrinth, led by light piercing through the vegetal roof. The first time that I've explored a forest starting at its roots. There are lots. It's amazing. Yeah, there's almost 10,000 square kilometers of it. Incredible. We're under a carpet of papyrus. What's great is that we can go underneath it into the caves, but I don't feel very safe here. I prefer being underwater. Our base camp is half lab and half boat. The captain, Greg Thompson, is a fisherman and an expert on fish biology. Vince Shax is the expedition leader, and he's backed up by Richard Boltach. He asked me to join this study on crocodiles and the food chain. Only 2% of hatchlings survive attacks by eagles, herons, and iguanas. They live on insects. As they get bigger, they attack frogs, then small fish, and then large catfish. If crocodiles disappear, catfish will consume all other fish, and therefore the food source for other species. I mean, it looks like mostly been eating uh, fish. I mean, it looks like maybe catfish or yeah. tilapia. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, that's definitely skin of catfish, so it's obviously had a big meal. But we just ate off a piece of it. But it's important for us to show that they're eating catfish. So we see the catfish are feeding on smaller tilapia. So it's like the buildup of the food chain that we're trying to show, and the crocs are eating the catfish. So this is an important thing to show. Where did you catch that guy? This guy was up uh... Vince has released 400 young crocodiles that were born in captivity into the 20 kilometer wide river in an attempt to control the catfish population. How many more will he have to release to rebalance things? He must also consider the river people. Each year, crocodiles attack and kill around 750 people in Africa. There are 15 attacks in the Okavango region. It is inhabited by the Hambakushu people, who have expanded their territories and are threatened by the large carnivore. They catch and kill baby crocodiles to stop them from becoming adults. They do not realize that catfish will devour all the other fish if the crocodiles disappear. The number of marsh antelopes here has increased since crocodiles became scarce. This is not the case for fish that live underneath the papyrus. We still haven't come across any fish. The catfish must have been here already. We find a hippopotamus skull and are reminded that we're in a wild area. These large herbivores enable the fish and crocodiles to colonize the area as they open up wide, dark passageways.
It's a labyrinth of shadow and light. It's dreamlike. We must be careful. Vince has advised us that if the water becomes murky, then it means that we are near a hippopotamus and must move. Just after noon, after warming up in the sun, the crocodiles slide into the 12 degrees cold water to regulate their temperature. Cedric and I agree that it's a good time to get out of the water. We're not prepared enough to approach them. Vince and Richard are preparing to release a crocodile that was captured the previous day. Good dog. It's part of their motion detection system, electric fields. There are many near its head. The crocodile can detect and therefore capture anything that comes near its mouth, whether the water is cloudy or clear, whether it's night or day. How do we identify one crocodile from another? These black markings as well as these yellow markings. This is almost like a fingerprint for the, for the crocodile. And each block basically gets its own numerical code based on whether it's completely black or with zero um, blackness. Mm -hmm. And so if we can get any digital photographs underwater of, of the animals and then also take a GPS point of where that animal okay. was seen, we already just have very, very basic identification and positional data. I'll try to take some photos. To do is to get this crocodile back into the water. Uh, picking it up, picking it up, picking it up. Tape's not off. Now we're going here. We hold, all right. Now Richard's going to take the tape off. Tape's coming off. Tape's okay, the off. tape's off. One, two, three. Straight into the darkness. I don't think there's a better location in the world. It's one of very few locations where you have the right conditions all at the same time. The visibility is good. The temperature is very cold. You know, the crocodiles are all concentrated in one area. So it's a very, very good opportunity to get close to crocodiles underwater and spend time with them because they, they're cold, so they don't move very much. And we know that the eyesight is not very good underwater. So he will know that you're there, but he's not going to identify you as prey. But we must be worried of them because it seems that the croc is okay. You guys have to be very, very careful with hippos. So if you were to keep quiet and get into the darkness, it would be a case of them getting away from you without knowing you're there. Um, if you were to cross it directly in the light, I don't want to be you, you know. <laughs> so we want the crocodiles to think that we're hippos and the hippos to think that we're crocodiles. <laughs> Vince explains that crocodiles move with the river current and that it flows according to rainfall hundreds of kilometers upstream. In November, the rain starts in Angola in the highlands, very high mm -hmm. um, cliffs, fast flowing rivers. So in November and December, we have the rain coming through Angolan highlands and funneling into the Kavango River. By January to March, the panhandle, the area we're in now, is at its highest. By April, it starts hitting the first alluvial fan of the delta and slowly filters through there because the gradient is much lo uh, lower and, and there's a lot more sediment so it's flatter. So once the water is in mound, which is the very end of the delta, the water in the panhandle is already dropped. We constantly have a wave that starts in Angola and slowly moves right down and that wave comes through every year in a perfect cycle. It's like an annual respiration cycle. When the water is at its lowest, all of these sandbanks, like this one here, for instance, are exposed and come out. And the crocodiles take per perfect advantage of that. And they use this to dig their nests, to oh, place okay. the eggs, um, and use these as nesting sites. So they are a perfect example of how a species has evolved to use this area 
the way that it functions naturally. Laurent? Hey. We're leaving. Before heading back underneath the papyrus, we explore the main channel. The current is strong, yet invisible, since there aren't any rocks blocking the river flow. Three thousand crocodiles inhabit the remaining 100 kilometers of the river. This is good for Vince, but not for us. I've never seen so many fish in a river. They've definitely escaped the catfish in this part of the river. Fishermen in the area live off these fish, but for how much longer? They're everywhere, jumping in the stream or resting on the bottom, bathed in an incredible yellow light. The papyrus is like a giant tea bag that filters out tannins. The water emerges transformed, clear, but colored. Suddenly, it's mayhem. The catfish have arrived. Millions of catfish inhabit the river. The banks shift suddenly and everything moves. All that remains afterwards is a catfish head. The work of a crocodile? Crocodiles don't swallow the head because it is covered with bony plates and has venomous spines on its pectoral fins. We are in a large predator's territory. Curiosity prevails and we decide to carry on. I know that it's dangerous, but I reassure myself that the water is still cold. This can cause a reptile's heart rate to drop to nearly one beat per minute and make them lethargic. There he is. It's a large male. We're in the heart of his 100-acre hunting ground. I'm sure that everyone will want to repeat the experience. That was rock and roll. I finally found a use for my diving knife. I used it to move in the current. It's very practical. I used it as a lever. It worked, right? We saw the crocodile leave with the current. The green color, the white sand, the thousand fish, and the fact that there might be a croc around. Or a hippo. Or a uh, hippo. Suddenly yeah. Yannick talked to Laurent and said, Hey Laurent, don't, don't you hear blah, 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 blah. At the same time, I hear blah, 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 blah. Then I'm like, okay, where is the hippo? Where is the hippo? So that makes a fantastic dive. It is. It's the oh, elephant on the island. Look, look at that. Elephant. Lucky. Amazing. Completely surrounded by water, and there's elephants yeah. on there. Really? Yeah.
crocodiles are fitted with satellite tags in order to track their whereabouts in the river. The information is used by scientists and also to warn the villagers of places that they should avoid. Walter, how does that tag look? Oh, that's good. It's, it's very big and heavy. Oh, wow. All right. OK, yeah, it's bigger. It's bigger than I thought it would be. This is going to be like a bit of on the back, the top. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be a good one. Crocodile capture takes place at night when the reptiles are hypnotized by torch beams. Vince has already captured and tagged more than 2,000 crocodiles for observation. We are looking for a crocodile of at least two meters. I'm haunted by our last dive, but I've been told that it's less risky to approach crocodiles underwater. It's almost zero degrees outside, and crocodiles warm themselves up in the water. We're seeing more of them on the banks. This means that the temperature is rising. They're more active than they were before. Ah! You don't go for that one. That would have been a mistake. Come on, Vince. This might be our only chance. No, never ever. We can't, we can't handle this. Here we go, here we go. We've got a movement coming on. A little bit of movement. I'm gonna bump the boat. Tear out of it. Just check us, scoot quickly, boss. Hold on, hold on. It just keeps going and going and going. The conditions are changing and this is making it harder to dive. It's running out, watch out, watch out, watch out. All right, it's out. Okay, you got him? He sounds angry. Are you putting a GPS tag on him? The idea with this is to fit on the nuchal shield, which is this here, in between these scales here, so we can use these holes in there, these holes in there. One, two, three. The GPS will transmit signals for one year and therefore one full river cycle. After a somewhat fresh start, the day soon heats up to almost 25 degrees. We head for the areas that are inhabited by males. It's a race against time. It's only safe to dive during a period of about one and a half months, and it's almost the end of this time frame. Any good crocodile dundees shave with a knife. Go for it. We're wearing special diving equipment that recycles our breath into oxygen using soda lime granules. This means that we don't make any bubbles and can approach the animals discreetly. This worries Vince and Richard. 
So you mean that the, the bubble can keep the crocodile away or the hippos away? Yeah, I, I think maybe, you know, they, they can hear us. And, and I think maybe the crocodiles think we're hippos, so they leave us alone. Or, you know, and with a rebreather, it's, it's, it's silent. So. It uh, can't hear you. It might think you're a fish or a crocodile, which is not necessarily a good thing. Head cameraman Yannick Gentil comes with us to take footage of the crocodiles reacting to the divers. to show the size of the animal. Yeah, yeah. If we are in front of a large adult male, then the only solution is that you pass behind him and we form a kind of sandwich. Yeah, that's right. If we sandwich him between us, there's always an area where he can escape. We can do that? We'll look for the classic movements, like when he's moving his tail or pushing on his shoulders. We can stop and move backwards. Did you see the hippos? Impressive. Quick, huh? Richard has brought gas and a harpoon with him in case a crocodile starts to attack us. Life in the wilderness has its risks. The crocodile is trying to camouflage himself. They also do this when they are catching fish. I try to reassure myself. Like all carnivores, he moves with poise and conviction. We are foreign to him. We move towards him, but there's no reason for him to attack us. Crocodiles come up for air every 30 minutes. Their movements between land and water are essential. Their bodies need to remain at 27 degrees in order to activate their digestive enzymes. Their hind feet are webbed for swimming. Their front feet are used for walking and are not webbed. The fear invoked by the crocodile is exhilarating. It's irrational, but the fear of being attacked causes an intense sensation and the feeling of living in the moment. Crossing the channel. Ah. The sheer power of this reptile is enough to scare anyone. Its jaws exert a ton and a half of pressure per square centimeter, and during its lifetime, a crocodile grows over 3,000 teeth. We've gone as far as we can go safely. We are at least 50 centimeters from his mouth. He doesn't attack us, but he is wary of us.
Large males only eat 50 meals per year and they can fast for two years. Lucky for us. Here, two territories overlap. This crocodile has a punctured eye and a torn front leg. Males fight when they're in their mating period. This behavior is triggered when the water temperature increases. Today, it rose from 12 to 14 degrees. I wasn't pushing him, he was coming to see you. Oh, you're oh are you sure? Yeah. Because I feel that it was like you said, he was kind of trapped, he tried to escape and face Laurent. He, he came out, he, was, he had plenty of space, he had 90 okay. degrees. Yeah. And he came out and he stopped and then he turned towards you. Yeah. Why? And, I don't know. I think at this time of the year, they're, just, they're more curious now. It's just, it's just telling us now that they, they're more aware of us than we think they are. Could be the bubbles, I mean, because no bubbles, and that guy is swimming away and he's like, oh. wait, that thing, no bubbles, no bubbles, fat, maybe it's one of me, <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> I've never seen this kind of behavior with sharks. They're very aggressive. When they turn and open their mouths, it's really aggressive. Yeah, but he was being prodded. If you prod a shark, he moves away, whereas they turn towards the pole and bite it. <laughs> it's different. He went straight for the contact. It's diving that shows us that they're not just calmly floating around like plastic crocodiles. <laughs> Before we continue our search, we need to check the floodplains. When water flows in from Angola, the riverbanks burst and the plains flood with water and sediment, and the crocodile territory expands. These ephemeral wetlands are inhabited by many species of fish. The water flow brings them here and they mate and lay eggs. The marshes are a breeding ground. We carry out an inventory on the plains. It's unbelievable to think that the crocodiles in the delta have such an effect on even the smallest of the fish here. If crocodiles disappear, then catfish will devour these areas. Greg explains that there are two species here that are able to defend themselves, but that the tilapia is more vulnerable. This is the largemouth squeaker. Be careful. Does it have spines? Yes, he has uh, very sharp spines. This little guy can actually lock oh. his fins. Wow. You see now? Right. Yeah, it's locked. And that is what his protection is, which stops other fish, like tiger fish and many birds, from swallowing him. You hear the noise. That's why they call it a squeaker. Do you hear the noise? Even a crocodile is very wary of a squeaker. You don't find them eating them much because with those fins locked, it can actually get wedged mm. in the crocodile's throat and it'll kill the crocodile. Okay. What's also interesting with this squeaker is he has another adaptation. Because there are less or there are no birds at night, as he turns upside down uh -huh. and he swims upside down, and skims the surface uh. at night, catching the insects which have fallen onto the water surface. And then during the day, they turn around and they feed on the bottom. The ability to go upside down may also help them to 
feed on the, the layer of papyrus underneath the cave. That's so you right. just uh, scavenge yeah, around and... I'm sure that's exactly yeah. what they do. This is obviously now the tigerfish. It's actually related to the piranha of South America. He's, uh, he's the top predator in the fish world in the Okavango. He can bite into other fish. He can bite small fish in half. Let's let him go. He doesn't like to be out, yeah. the, out the water for long. This is one of the, the larger tilapia species that we get in the Okavango. You see he's got a very narrow face and you see that large mouth. It's like a bucket and sucks those fish in. There are 71 species of fish in the Okavango and the catfish could wreak havoc here. They're extremely voracious and they even eat each other. They can measure up to five feet and weigh up to 15 kilos. Greg is an experienced fisherman, but he's never swum in the papyrus fields. We need to go back and look at different behavior patterns and look for new information. starts to recede and it takes the sediment with it. This gives the water an opaque look and visibility is low. Clear water diving is a rarity here. There are kilometers of dark intersecting passages. Hippos could appear at any given moment. We examine the plant roots. Vegetation is the base of all food chains. It seems that a predator has already been here. We see a squeaker, just like the one we saw in the aquarium. As Vince explained, they swim backwards and feed on sediment that is clinging to plant roots. There are lots of them swimming around and feeding off the plants. Bulldog fish can communicate with each other by using infrasonic calls. However, the catfish can also detect them. It looks as if all the small fish are hiding. The catfish are quick. They are masters of the dark. Apart from the squeakers, they eat almost everything in sight. We decide to follow them. It's important that we keep track of where we are, because if we get lost in the dark, then it could take us four to six hours to find a way out. We drift off course, but our compass helps us get back on track. We have to admit that we are lost. Suddenly, Richard calls out and starts to gesticulate. He's seen an enormous crocodile. We don't have time to turn around. 
The crocodile has disturbed a cloud of mud and our vision is blurred. We barely see him disappearing into the dust. We're stuck in the dark and each second lasts an eternity. I now know that it's possible to feel hot in cold water. We're happy to return. In a dark and dingy cave, there it is. Biggest crocodile ever. Did you see his head in the shadows? It was visible in the light. We moved over, just snuck past us, and then... And the vis was gone. Visibility disappeared. And when it happens underwater, at night, and there's a crocodile, you just think to yourself, OK, stay calm. Yeah, exactly. I think I lost a few centimeters. <laughs> the worst nightmare come yeah. true. Yeah. You know, you're in, in a cave with no visibility, don't know the way out, and there's a four meter crocodile, a crocodile in there somewhere. with you. We did, we crawled out and, and we basically leopard crawled through over the papyrus, over the papyrus to the oh. boat. We decide to return and set up an observation camera. The plan is to set it up next to the lair. The larger reptiles usually hide themselves far away. We head back toward the papyrus. We find our way back by following the tracks that were made by our equipment. It looks like this croc has just gone in there. Yeah, the, the water is all muddy there, huh? And that's just the way we came out, like. That was scary, huh? Just there, huh? You know, you know what, the, what the scary thing is? That it's probably a four meter crocodile that's lying down yeah. underneath us. Probably need to put the camera over there. The openings that we saw on our first dive were made by crocodiles. They used them for breathing beneath the papyrus. Lloyd Wilmot is flying in the sky above us. The former crocodile hunter is scouting a location for a canoeing expedition. The aim is to explore remote water points in order to find out if the crocodiles have colonized difficult to access territories. looking for remote areas that have been untouched by humans. Vince will then re-release crocodiles into these waters. Lloyd tells us about his days as a hunter and the animal instinct that he felt when he was out in the wilderness. He risked his life several times. It's a way of having a bit of fun. If you don't have a little bit of devilry in you, then you might as well be dead. <laughs> At dawn, a dead crocodile floats down the river. What do you guys think about that? It's likely that another male killed him during a mating battle. Probably killed him fighting. Crocodiles eat each other and even their offspring when they are hungry. Before we set out, we look at the images that were taken on Yannick's hidden camera. There could be nothing. Excellent! But it can't have been an otter that caused us to run out of the cave. Four meter crocodile is an otter. They go into crocodile lairs? They're not scared. 
that was the last thing I expected to come out of that hole. Was it was natural. Which means that they might also be under the papyrus hunting, hunting for fish the same way. So this means that other animals use crocodile layers too. <laughs> No way! He's massive! <laughs> we were right to hurry. <laughs> we were in the hole, in the dark, with that beast. Do you see it also? No! You just saw the, the I, was, I was filming that stupid fish yeah. <laughs> pass behind me. Ah. And the only thing I saw is his face, a frog face. Like, <laughs> so when I saw his face, you knew I was, something. Fuck. <laughs> we better get out of here. And when I turned over, yeah. no more viz. Yeah. I think it's been feeding underneath, and we've never seen this crocodile in that channel. Mm. Mm. But. It looks like he uses it often. He knows this mm, site perfectly. He uses it a lot. I can't imagine for a big territorial male crocodile like that that that's his prime spot. Mm -hmm. He's made that site in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. He'll maybe stay there now. Just fat enough while the breathe. catfish are starting mm. yeah. to move out of the floodplains. <laughs> Vince had not seen this crocodile before. This proves that males are hiding beyond the papyrus. They come to the shore when the water level falls. The large fish leave the floodplains and head straight into the path of their predators. We should be able to see whether the crocodiles are leaving by the main channel. 95% of the females lay eggs here, but only 22% of the nests are productive. Vince needs to check if the females have laid eggs in these nests. We know from, from a database that was collected by croc farmers in the 80s that they were collecting about 250 nests in the panhandle. We are only finding about 50 to 55 nests a year. So it's not the fact that there are fewer adults, it's the fact that the adults aren't nesting as much as they should be. And what we've put that down to is the fact that there's a huge amount of disturbance in this area. Human disturbance, mm. boats. Even, boats. Even the fishermen going into remote areas yes. where normally it was quiet, quiet, mm. now woo, woo, boats, boats all over the place. I mean, Lloyd, maybe you can help, but we, we desperately like to get into this channel over here. I can see it extends. It's quite a long channel, but this is this it's, it's section, cut. it's blocked cut. Could we go by boat? Be careful, hippos. Yeah. How much vegetation will we have to penetrate to reach the channel? If we, if we use uh, satellite imagery... Ah, oh, I see, okay. okay. You, you can start measuring the distance ah, between the main channel and... Ça, la That's how far we'd have to cut away with machetes using canoes to push the papyrus aside. It's far. Yeah. If we find crocodiles here, it means that they have been forced to leave the main channels, even though they're teeming with fish. The only way that crocodiles can get through the papyrus is by using the pathways that have been made by hippos. There is no other access. There we go. There's a nice little opening here. This is the lower half of the channel that I really wanted to get into. So this is great. I mean, you can see already, there's a lot of water coming down here. Mm -hmm. It's much wider than the channel we just came in. There's very little disturbance. There's no people, there's no boats. So it's perfect for crocodile nesting. You see that wake in the front there? The look, at, look at the disturbance in the water. Vince, can you see any areas that are suitable for nesting? No, I do. I actually see quite a few sites that I think crocs could use. 
There's a lot of reed banks over here, which are great for nesting. And then even these little isolated islands in the middle of the floodplains here, they can all be used. You need to remember now that there's also, we've got about another two months of water dropping. And once that water level's dropped, a lot more sites will become exposed. How many nests do you think you could add to your list? I think we could probably add another one or two nests to the database from this channel. Vince goes looking for tracks. We find some on a sandy beach. It's an ideal place for nesting. They probably belong to a female. We're now going to look below the surface. It's beautiful, like an underwater forest, but there are hardly any fish and therefore not enough food for crocodiles. We come across the remains of a reptile egg. It's more than likely that it was eaten by an iguana. A crocodile that comes to a place that is poor in animal life is either trying to escape a dominant male or river people. The temperature has risen to 16 degrees. Mating season has started again, and the males have become increasingly aggressive. They might mistake us for rivals or females. It's starting to become risky. The first incident was a warning. This will be our last dive. We see tigerfish fleeing catfish. The Okavango water levels are starting to fall and the papyrus is sinking into the sand and closing the door to paradise for another year. The fish are migrating into the main channels. The expedition is coming to an end. Vince's fears have been confirmed. There is a need to increase the crocodile population here. An imbalance could create many problems. <laughs> Vince is tracking the crocodile that he tagged. He's moving, going with the current on the surface. It looks like he's following the river flow and heading towards the delta. Our observations could help Vince to persuade the fishermen and the river people of his views. He explains to children that this large reptile might not be their friend, but that he could be their best ally. There's still a lot to learn about crocodiles. They are thought to be solitary animals, but they detect infrasonic communication. They return to their territory after being displaced up to dozens of kilometers away. They create natural law and necessary law across the Okavango. Eradicating this predator would be even riskier than diving with him.